You're listening to the 2020 Nelson Arts Festival Poka Poka Talks. This session, Writing Young Adult Fiction, features Bryn Murray, Robin Prokop and Rachel Craw in conversation with Mandy Hager. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome to the Nelson Arts Festival and Poka Poka Talks. This is our sixth session now, so, um, and I'm absolutely delighted to see so many young people here today. Thank you very much for coming, and of course, we're, right, we're talking all about books for you, so I'm just very pleased to see you here. My name's Kerry Sunderland, and I'm the coordinator of the Puka Puka Talks program, and I'm very delighted to introduce Mandy Hager, who will be chairing or facilitating this panel discussion, um, and I hope participating in it as much as she asks questions, because of course Mandy is a multi-award winning writer of books, of, of stories for, for young people, and um, we're very delighted to have her here with the help of the New Zealand Society of Authors who supported her travel down. So I'm going to um, just ask you to turn on your phones on silent or turn them off so that we don't have any ringing during the session. We are recording, so when we get to, we're going to have a little bit of time at the end for questions. Um, please, I'll pass around the microphone so you can ask um, the questions on the mic so we get it, pick them up in the recording. So please join me in um, welcoming the panel. Mandy's going to introduce the rest of the panellists, so big round of applause. Kia ora koto. it's really lovely to be here and thank you to Kerry and the team for inviting me. It's always nice to be here. Um, I feel really excited to introduce you to these extremely talented writers beside me. Um, they've written utterly immersive stories that um, I've asked them to read a little bit to you because I know once you hear them you're going to want to go and buy them because they're all so good. So next to me is Robin Prokop, then we've got Bryn Murray and Rachel Craw, all of whom I really recommend you go and grab their books and read them. We're going to start with each of them just giving you a little five minute reading, then I'm going to start some questions and we're going to have what I'm thinking might well be a rambly conversation and then I'll try and um, make sure that we get about ten minutes at the end for questions. So I think we'll just start with reading, and um, maybe we'll start with you, Rachel. Um, so I'm going to read you guys the opening chapter of The Rift, um, which is, I don't really know what to call it. Perhaps you'd call it an urban fantasy. I don't know. Um, but it's a story about a community of rangers who live on an isolated island where they care for an ancient herd of mystical deer. Um, and the deer are under threat from poachers, um, and they're also under threat from a major um, pharmaceuticals company who are very keen to get their hands on the antlers because the antlers contain a potent healing compound um, that can pretty much fix whatever ails you. Um, and so they like to get their, their hands on that and make huge amounts of money out of it. Um, there also happens to be another problem on the island um, in that there is a dimensional rift. You've got to watch out for those, right? Um, and every full moon, um, that rift um, gets a little bit wobbly and um, hounds, hellhounds, come through um, and, and go after those deer looking to destroy them. So our, the Blackwater Rangers, the name of the island is Blackwater, and the Blackwater Rangers have a lot of work to do protecting these deer. Um, and the opening chapter is from the point of view of one of the apprentice rangers, who is a boy named Cal. Cal has a number of unusual gifts, which I won't try and explain to you. Um, <laughs> but one of them is that uh, one of the results of his gifts is that he can often sense the presence of death, um, which is more handy than you might expect. Um, but in the opening chapter, he discovers one of his deer um, has been caught in a poacher's snare, and he's quite unhappy about it. So... We'll give it a go. Um, it's called Warning Notes. Cal's too late. He knows it even as he leaps down the thickly treed slope, 
knees jarring with the impact of each footfall. Certainty, like an iron clamp, fastens at the top of his throat, making his breath short. The long oil skin hampers his stride, his rifle thumps, bruising his hip. Heavy rain slicks his hair to his face, and he mops it back, hot with frustration and fear. Everything is working against him. Weather, terrain, gear, the thunder of his pulse, obscuring the voice of the herd. Clinging to that internal flare of instinct, Kel makes for the western spit. He strains to hear past the torrential rain. There's no howling, not yet. Maybe it's too far from the rift for the animal's distress signal to draw the hounds. Or maybe that's wishful thinking. There's only four days until the moon grows full and the timing could not be worse. Reaver's frantic cawing echoes above the treetops and he curses her, useless bird. He could have used the aerial support to boost his night vision. His boots slide in the wet mud and leaf mold threaten to wrench his ankles. It must be a full five minutes since he first felt the alarm up on the ridgeway. Perhaps he should be grateful he's too agitated to tap into it now. The signal must be roaring with grief. That first sign of distress had been a shock vibration in his mind, like the string of a fragile instrument viciously plucked. If he'd been concentrating, he'd have caught the earlier warning notes of danger and deployed his raven to scout. But he hadn't been paying attention. Too self-absorbed obsessing over the news that he'd heard in the mess hall this morning. Meg Archer is coming home. Meg Archer. When the signal from the old herd finally broke through into his consciousness, panic cost him precious seconds and his link with Reva. Cal curses himself. This proves everything that I've ever said about you, you worthless piece of... An image flashes into his mind. A doe, tall, slender, strong, a sable coat with silver markings on her chest and flanks, deep, brown, fathomless eyes, ancient, knowing, wild. His gut plummets. Oh, God, what if it's felon? What if it's felon and she's been killed by a trapper's snare? The unthinkable shame of losing the matriarch of the old herd. It scrambles his brain. He pictures himself denounced by the head ranger. Before the whole community cast out under the full weight of his failure, heralding the total collapse of everything the Blackwater Rangers stand for. Thousands of years of toil, trials and tradition passed from parent to child, nullified in a single night's screw-up by a kid who never really deserved to be counted amongst their ranks. God, God, please don't let it be felon. As if her name in his thoughts summons it, the voice of the herd flickers in his mind. He gasps or sobs and skids to a stop. Chest heaving, quads and calves burning, the momentary relief of connection fills him, centers him. Oneness, wonder and longing for the mountain. Longing for the veins of living energy pulsing in the ley lines. He listens, even that small flicker thrums with oppressive grief. Knowing fills him, confirming the location like an internal GPS. There in the deep shadows, 40 feet below where the narrow track twists back on itself, a light grey smudge swings from a noose. His skin contracts with goosebumps. If his hair wasn't slicked to his head, tendrils would rise at the nape of his neck. He sees the antlers and his heart beats. It's not Fallon. It's not Fallon. Wow, thank you. <laughs> A wonderful start. And now, Bryn, if you could thank you. introduce us. Well, this is the third book in my Children of the Furnace trilogy. And for the purposes of this, what you need to know is that um, during the second book, it's set in a dystopian world post climate change. The three main, ca main characters are Jace, Will and Leah, 
And throughout the second book, Jace and Leah are under the impression that Will is dead for a great deal of that book. So the resolution, I've cheated a little bit because it's a cardinal sin in trilogies. Every book is supposed to have a resolution and be standalone to some extent, even though it's part of the trilogy. But I cheated a little bit because there is a cliffhanger at the end of book two. And in actual fact, I've started book three with that cliffhanging chapter. So there is a kind of resolution, okay, but then it moves on to the cliffhanger as well. And I've chosen that chapter, which is actually the last chapter of book two, because it's in Leah's voice. And Leah speaks in conventional English, whereas Will speaks in a dialect, which I don't think I can render. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's a boy as well. <laughs> so. So towards evening, the rain stops and great thunderheads march across the sky in lurid reds and purples. Low misty cloud clears so that for the first time we can see dark shafts of rain slant against inland hills. Harper comes in with high nervous spots of colour on her cheekbones. There's a chopper coming in. Who can it be? Judah's anxious. It could be a gunship. Then it seems that's her old scoper instinct for drama. Because when we follow her back to Judah and his screens, he's perfectly calm. A light is blinking on his circles. Has to be a chopper at the speed it's going, he says. Must have followed the ice road over the ocean. They'll be near out of fuel and it's getting dark. There used to be an old helipad, a landing place out there in the compound. Used to have lights too to guide choppers in, but they ain't been used for long years now. No way M lights will be working. We could use flares, Jay says. You got any? Yeah. Judah looks at him surprised and nods to a low cupboard. Jace dives in, grabs some and heads out. Judah makes a call through some old-style equipment with headphones. Calling Blackbird, Blackbird, this is Ice Station 1. Repeat, Ice Station 1. Please identify yourself, Blackbird. Over. There's a long, crackly wait, and then a strangely familiar voice comes over the clumpy old equipment. We ain't got no weapons. Don't want no trouble. We're just coming hunting. I can't believe it. Judah mumbles something suspicious about, oh, it's a long way to come just for hunting, but I lean in over him. Lars? Lars? Is that really the best excuse you could come up with? God's death, you've had hours to think up something. There's a brief silence. Leah, crackles a voice. My insides turn to water and my head swims. Leah, I must be going mad. My knees give way. I reach out to grip the back of Judah's seat. Are you in that place up ahead, Leah? Will, will, I whisper. My breath's all used up by the beating of my heart like it's about to bur burst out of my chest. Are you okay? We saw you on the scope. It can't be. But then his voice comes again, warm and true. You mean the crucifying? We were crucified, true. And my hands and feet don't work too good yet, but a lot of us got away, Leah. We survived. Suddenly I'm crying, harder than I've ever cried in my life before. Terrible noises like I'm in pain. Dottie leans in and talks over my sobs. Jace is here, Will. He's gone to play some flares. Yeah, we can see him. We race out, Dottie and Mari, a half-seen blur either side of me, to where Jace is sticking the last flares into the wet earth. The sodden, snow-crushed pasture is indigo in the deepening gloom. Terror gripes my guts. He's been dead to me for so long. That voice, that voice. Surely it can't have been a dream, but I don't dare believe. Jace has marked out a rough circle. The chopper's a dark silhouette against a wild sky of scarlet and gold and purple racing clouds. It descends as the flares spurt and fizz orange and lands rockily, blades throbbing. The wind rush whips my hair and blinds my eyes. The door slides back. And he jumps out while the blades are still turning and noise and wind drown out thought. But it's him. It's true. Will's alive. And he sprints over, bent low, and picks me up and whirls me round. And he's laughing, but I have no words. And he must find it strange that my weeping won't stop. The tears pour and pour, like all the weeping I held in for so long is pouring out now when I should be happy. And I can't let him go either. I hold him to me with an iron grip, like I never want to let him go again. I need to feel his live, strong body against mine, feel the rhythm that I thought was gone forever, and his heart's blood warm. Suddenly, I know what that means really means. And now Jace is here and he thumps Will on the back and Will tries to thump him too but he can't because he's all tangled up with me and I've got him so tight and Wood is laughing and so is Jace, Jace, who I've never seen laugh ever. And now Jace is trying to tell him that this is Mari, his sister. 
and Ma is here too, her head tilted to one side shyly, and I know it's time to let Will go just a little, because this is a big moment for these two who shared the same womb. So I force myself to loosen my grip and step aside with my arms still around him, but giving enough space that he can see her properly. For once, Will's not got words tumbling out of his mouth, but has the strangest look on his face. They both do, him and Mari. They're not like strangers meeting for the first time, because strangers don't gaze on one another like this. Their eyes with the golden highlights and long lashes and bright open stare mirror each other's, but it's not that I don't think that they recognise. It's like they just see each other and know, though they've not met since the day they were born. Mari, my sister, Will says softly at last. Will, my brother. Jace lifts his head and goes still. I know that look. Will does too and I feel his body tense. He breaks his gaze from Mari and I turn with him to see what Jace has seen. All around us, between flares jetting against the deep, wild sky, tall, dark shapes stalk from the shadows. In seconds, a bristling ring of dark steel surrounds us, predators with their faces hidden behind black helms. Soldiers of the unity, they used to be called, but now they serve only the revelation. They hold still scores of obsidian sentinels until one with a silhouette like a strange, cruel bird steps aside, bending his long neck in deference. Poor Pole. I see with a cold shock that Harper is beside him. She steps aside too, and in the last gleam of sun, her small, pinched face doesn't know whether to gloat or shrink in shame. She shivers in her skin, and it won't fit good tonight. A huge, ungainly, lopsided figure strides into the gap they've made, his sleeve flapping where Will took his arm at the burning. His beard is as shaggy as ever for all his new grandeur, and his eyes still roll wild with passion. The rubbery loose lips open to show a throat wet and red as fresh blood as he bellows in triumph. Will Sherwood roars high patriarch sex. <laughs> <laughs> I can't walk. You're going to have to keep your mouth at short time. Thank you. And Bryn's launching that book after this session, so stay on and join her. Kia ora. Um, I feel like saying, and now for something completely different. <laughs> um, so um, my book is a fantasy, um, so it has a quest narrative. I'm just going to bring you up today. I'm going to read something from chapter two. Um, so um, this, a creepy hermit has come down into the city um, and has negotiated for the services of two slaves, and the slaves have gone to his hut um, to, to, to find out what is going on. Um, Ash has um, been told that he is, going, he is to scrub a triangle in the middle of the hut, which he's a bit perplexed about. Um, and they're about to find out a little bit more. The Malshorn joined Bragg by the fire and lowered himself into his chair, slowly leaning heavily on its arms. Then he just sat there, all hunched up, eyes closed, with silver hair trailing down his face. In the silence, Ash became aware of a steady ticking noise. Soon he was scrubbing in time with the measured beat. Time stretched where the firelight flickered across the Malshorn's face. At long last, he lifted his head and fixed Bragg with an intense glare. I am Crater. His voice was cracked but proud. You will call me Tail Crater. As a sign of respect for my age and wisdom, the paths of my life have been many, but... He paused and gasped a bit, clutching at his chest before continuing. But all you need know is that I am the Keeper of the song. A sudden movement in the woodpile behind Ash caused him to jump. He scanned the pile anxiously, but before he could chain his ears on the source, the Malshorn began to cough, and he kept coughing in horrible, rasping rattles. When he reached for the goblet on the table beside him, Bragg quickly leaned forward to guide it into his shaking hands. The Malshorn drew it to his lips, sucking at its dark contents, which left a black trace down one side of his mouth. After a few minutes, the dreadful spluttering began to ease, and Kreda gestured again. The stone, boy! Pass me the stone! He seemed to be pointing at a silver orb set on an elaborate plinth, which sat nearby on a bench. Ash completely understood Bragg's perplexed expression. It looked nothing like a stone whatsoever. Don't touch the stone itself. Here, bring it here. The contents of the orb swirled like liquid silver as Bragg lifted the plinth. 
He carried it carefully, his eyes bright with curiosity. Kareda snatched the orb to his chest, closed his eyes again. After long minutes of waiting, Brague began to shuffle on his stool. He kept stealing glances in Ash's direction, but Ash ignored him and kept scrubbing, terrified of what might happen if he stopped. Then, to Ash's absolute horror, Brag cleared his throat. Uh, please, tell Crater, he spluttered. Please tell me about the quest. What is it that I'm to do? Ash had to admire his nerve. The Malshorn grimaced, but he opened his eyes and sat up a little. He took another sip of the black liquid and nodded slowly. The song, boy. You must learn the song. Oh, thank you. So you can get a sense of how um, fascinating and addictive these books are. And I, I was very lucky to um, read all of them in a go when I was supposed to be doing lots of other work and I just couldn't put them down. And it was just, and now I can't wait to get hold of Bryn's next one and Robin's next one and Rachel's next one. So um, I know from experience that sometimes um, the very first spark of a book can be some really randomly odd thing that just gets your brain kind of working. But there are other times when you get a whole story delivered to you from start to finish. So I'm just really interested to know what the spark of each of the beginnings of these stories were and how you then tackled it. Because I, sometimes I've had to go on kind of like a detective to find where the story's leading me. So I'm interested to hear that process. So Robin, maybe we'll start with you. Um, I think Tailstone really started with a boy, um, a student of mine, well actually two students, um, and he was an invisible boy, um, interestingly. And he, uh, the, the one student had kind of tawny grey hair and I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I'd quite like to have a character with grey hair like that. And then the other student um, kept getting marked absent by the teachers and, and, and he'd say to me, Miss, I was there yesterday and I'd go, oh, no, have I done it again? I'm so sorry. And he said, don't worry, miss, I'm the invisible boy. Everyone does it. And I thought that would be quite a good hero, the invisible boy or the boy that tries to be invisible. Um, and then as I started writing about him, the song, I didn't, wasn't planning to write about music, but the music kind of came with my younger daughter who was um, a singer-songwriter, and I got hooked into being fascinated. So, but it did start with the boy. Great. Funnily enough. So with character. Yeah. Mm. Excellent. What about you, Bryn? Well, um, the original inspiration for this was a very long time ago, and it was character. And it's, uh, I was a social worker long before I was a teacher, back in the UK. And we were tasked, some other social workers and I, were taking some adolescents down to an outdoor education centre, a sort of an adventure centre where you do abseiling and canoeing and that kind of thing, down in the West Country. And we took our kids down there, and they were holding kids, you know, they were burned through foster placements, they were out of school, they were tough kids. And it was remarkable that within a very few hours, they were like the top dogs over the dons of this place. You know, they pushed the other kids around, they took their money, borrowed their trainers, pushed to the front of the queues. So the other social workers I was with, they took the, they, we had a debate about it. They said, well, this proves that the bad eggs always rise to the top, you know, the, the bad people always win, the rougher, the tougher, the more ruthless, the less considerate you are, the more success you'll know in life. Well, I took the opposite view, and I was the only one who did, but I was quite au fait with um, Richard Dawkins and the selfish gene, because I was a scientist and I was quite keen on evolution and natural selection. And I said, well, if that was the case, we'd all be ruthless, murderers, mercenaries, there'd be no cooperation, no consideration, no empathy. So, um, yeah, and so from that was born the idea that supposing you did have a character with a rock-solid moral core who was placed into an absolutely shocking situation, would decency prevail? Would he be able to influence the other people to take on his view of the world. So that was that was the absolute long ago spark. There was a long time of the nurturing and loads of other stuff came in as well mm. <laughs> over duration. It's fascinating. Yeah. Oh, well over 20 years. Mm. I'm well, going to come back to that, but um, Rachel. Um, I am often uh, about a, a landscape or a location first in, in a lot of my stories and um, and I was really inspired by Maggie Staffader's The Scorpio Races, um, which is my favorite YA book of all time. Um, and, and that's set on a wonderful, wonderful misty island. 
and I have, was obsessed with this island, and I'm like, I've got to write a book that's on an island. <laughs> you know, like, what is my island? What does it look like? And, and, and so the vision for Blackwater Island came to me, you know, just sort of slowly revealed itself through the mist, as it were. Um, and I was also really toying with the idea of writing a shapeshifter novel. I was really thinking about a guy who could turn into a stag, and, and I was thinking about that, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure, you know, there's a lot of that. Surely there's going to be a lot of that around. And, and I started Googling man turns into stag. And, <laughs> as you um, do. As you do. And, yeah, there were loads of um, old myths, a lot of cool Celtic myths. And, but the myth that got me really excited was the story of um, Actaeon, um, who goes hunting one night and stumbles across the goddess Artemis bathing naked in the woods. And she is so furious about that that she curses him. He turns into a stag, and then he is ripped apart by his own hunting dogs. I just thought that was wild, and I loved that. But I was most interested in the curse, and I loved the idea of, like, well, what would that curse look like now? What if that had stayed in his bloodline? What if it had traveled down through the generations and the generations? And that's how I landed on Blackwater Island with these rangers and... And so it's sort of a detail that doesn't, isn't explored in any great depth, but it's vaguely referred to in the novel, is that the herd of mystical deer are actually Actians. Yeah, that's ancestors. Great. That's great. Through the time, through the ages. And yeah. sometimes the seeds of that idea mm. actually disappear by the time yeah, you write totally, the rest of the story. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Because I'm like, what? People are like, what is with the crazy hellhounds? And I'm like, well. <laughs> And I just love the idea of this curse that would just be drawing these dogs through space and time, you know, forever and ever. Like they would be constantly hunting his bloodline. And yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, when you were talking, um, Bryn, I was thinking what we bring to our stories that we don't think of as writer's business, but that is the kind of wealth of the rest of our lived lives that informs the stories and comes through kind of whether you want it to or not. And so you're, you know, you're reading your scientific stuff around evolutionary biology and that kind of thing. That must impact on, on, on themes and the way that you think about how people behave and, and, you know, your music coming through, Robin, that kind of impact of that. So what do you think is the strongest thing that you as a person bring to your writing that makes it kind of different from others or that's, you know, that's the you part of the story because even though we make stories up, there's always huge parts of ourselves in them, just not in a really kind of autobiographical way, but we still feed our stories with our own experiences. Well, I'll let you start, Rachel, and then I'll... Uh, that's such a deep, deep, <laughs> wonderful question. Um, I don't know if I have an immediate answer for The Rift, but I know that when I was writing the Spark Trilogy, which is a series that I wrote before this, and that is all about genetic engineering, and, and that was loosely inspired by my experience of adoption. And uh, when I met my birth mother for the first time, I was so blown away by the power of DNA mm. and like the idea that you could be so like someone that you have never spent any time with in your life. Like, so there's no environmental influence, but that you could still be talking like them, that you could have the same interests, the same talents, the same mm. mannerisms as someone that you have literally never spent any time with. And, um, and my, so my brain was like, you know, just hugely, I'm like, could it be that everything that we are is actually already coded in our DNA? Like, is free? Is there any free will? You know, <laughs> you just, I was so overwhelmed by that concept. And, um, and so, yeah, I, that, was, that was a big part of my exploration. And so the central character in that series had been genetically engineered and was questioning, like, do I have any choice about who I am or the choices that I make? And so, you know, that was a big influence in that story. And I mean, those books did incredibly well. And I'm wondering if part of that was because you bought your, your yeah. own sort of emotional force to that story. So it really yeah. kind of made it feel That's real. A good question, Mandy. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> 
Who yeah, knows? Yeah, yeah. What, what do you think, Bryn? Well, it's a very big question, as Rachel said. Um, I think for me, science is like the background to... Uh, I mean, I do bring a scientific background to it, so it has to make sense. It has to make sense. So it annoys me when I read books that it doesn't work. You know, it's um, illogical or the facts are wrong or stuff like that, and that's surprisingly frequent as well. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Name <laughs> names. <laughs> <laughs> you did fine, don't worry. <laughs> um, I actually... Um, I think, the, for me, the most important thing, actually... We're going back to character, but I'm very interested in child development. And I've worked with children for over 25 years, social worker first, then teacher. I love the new entrant level. I'm very interested in brain development in the early years. So I always think, is, is this character plausible? Would this character really have turned out like this if they had had this background, if they had had no caring in the first three, three years of life? So for me, the characters always rise up from where, where they started from. I think those first three years, five years of life are so important. Mm -hmm. And to really know your character, you have to know their background right back to that. So, yeah, I would say that's, that's something that, to me, is really key to my writing. Thank you. Yeah. And you get a bonus question. Um, because sci you had that scientific background, yeah. do you then have to do, like, a brain shift that I'm, I'm now putting away my analytical brain and I'm just going to enter into the creative part of the writing process, or are you able to just kind of meld no, the two? No, it doesn't work like that for me at all. As I say, the, the science is just there. It's a given. It's a background. Right. So, like, the, the climate change background of Children of the Furnace and the post-climate change dystopian world, I didn't really need to think about it. You know, I saw a NASA picture, actually, where um, the middle of the... It's a prediction. It's a fairly old prediction now. It's about the time I wrote the story, but it still holds good. You look at a map of the world and the middle um, between the parallels is quite bright red and then there's like an orange zone and the poles are cool and that's like 100 years' time. This is what it could be like if we carry on on the path we're going. And so in Children of the Furnace, I made between the parallels, the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer, that's virtually uninhabitable by humans. And so that's just the background. Yeah, and then what really works for me is thinking about the people and the story. You know, you, for me, a story is really important as well. You have to have a narrative. Yeah. Yeah. So Thank people, you. People first, background. Yeah, <laughs> good. Thank you. Yeah. What about you, Robin? Um, I think it's a story about story. Um, and I think, again, it it's comes from teaching history, um, you know, studying and teaching history and English. Um, and then um, I mean, it's, I've always been interested in who gets to speak, um, who gets a voice. Um, and that combined with the... Um, I, I didn't want to do something where the world is so divided. I wanted to kind of bring... Brings, I think story and singing and language all brings people together. Um, so when I, so that background in history and the classics and all that sort of thing, kind of came up against watching my daughter performing to an audience, and just seeing that rapture and the connected and 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 looking at all different types of song, which is kind of story and song, same 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 thing. Mm. So it's yet yeah, complicated. Fascinating, though. Um, mm. So all these books have really um, intricate and well well built worlds that feel very real. They have, you know, they have their own sort of laws and shape and and rules to them. And um, I know from having taught people um, novel writing for ten years that there are some people that just get stuck in world building and kind of can never move past it to actually write a story, that that is the fascination for them. So I'm interested in that process of how you tackled world building and, and what your process was, and at what point you knew that it was now time to write so that you didn't get caught up in that um, circular, mm. just that process. Robin. Gosh. Um, I think for me, I was I was more of a discovery writer when 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 I started out writing this. So that I built the world as I went, um, and then fleshed it out as I went along. So it kind of was like a spiral of going back and thinking, okay, well now how what's the polit political structure of this new place that I've just put on my map? <laughs> so it, it was partly that. But what happened with the second book? is it was like, oh, okay, I've really complicated life for myself and now I need to really kind of... Uh, and I probably did overthink it. I, I probably panicked a bit. Um, yeah, the things work hand in hand for me. Mm. Yeah, but but I, think, I think pulling back, yeah, knowing when to pull back, most of the stuff does make its way into the book, I think. Cool, thank you. What about you, Bryn? 
Well, I have to admit, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about the world building. I didn't for this one anyway. It was just there. It sounds ridiculous. But once I'd seen this NASA thing, and I knew that um, Will's World, Sekulam, was going to be in the Northern Hemisphere, near the Northern Pole, and then the centre of civilization and the cities are going to be near the South Pole, and they're actually New Zealand, Australia, Antarctica, and the southern tip of South America, but that's never specified. It's just called South and Southern Hem Hemisphere cities. And then basically after that, it was just... I knew it was going to be a patriarchy, and I knew it was going to be a fanatical religious patriarchy because I was quite concerned at fanaticism and the rise of fanaticism at the time. <clears throat> and that seemed to me a really important issue to address. And it sounds a little bit like patronising, but with young people, you know, because uh, fanaticism does not recognise human rights or freedoms. So I wanted to make it clear that they were not um, amenable to reason, not amenable to truth or science or fact or argument. It was like, it's a belief system, so this is the way it is. So the rules fell into place after that. And because it's a post-climate change world, obviously the goal of the fanatical um, people in charge, which is actually a worthy goal, but it justifies their tyranny, is sequestrating carbon back from the atmosphere to create a livable world again. So that, of course, lends their, um, their tyranny, uh, it justifies their tyranny because mm -hmm. their ideals are true and just, but the way they implement them gives them absolute power. Yeah, so, so the social structure took quite a lot of work, but the, the world itself, I guess I suppose I could say that... I think that I see the social structure as part of the world. Yes. So when you say that took a bit of work, yes. what do you mean? Uh, well, because I, I, first of all, I was thinking, am I going to make it secular? Am I going to make it religious? In the end, it was a melding of the two. And then ultimately, there is a conflict between the secular side of the tyranny and the religious side of the tyranny, which is also reflected in history. I'm sure mm. Robin would agree. <laughs> I hope so. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I can't remember where I was going with that now. <laughs> <laughs> Just about setting up the social structure and how that feeds into the world building. So it was all kind of part of the it one big like thing. Oh, I know, it was Greenland. I was going to talk about Greenland a little bit. So I had to make up my mind where I was going to set it in the Northern Hem Hemisphere. And it's not Greenland, it's like a fictionalised Greenland. But I needed a large land mass quite near the North Pole. And it's definitely fictionalised for a reason that I'm not going to tell you. Spot, spot what's wrong with Greenland, if you read it. <laughs> but it's called Seckerland. And I happened to read somewhere that the um, Greenland is like a big sort of triangle like that. And it's got high um, mountains and hills around the outside. But the majority of the inland part of Greenland is actually below sea level. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be a great thing if, you know, people, if once sea level started rising... The ice caps have melted, but the interior of Greenland remains dry. And so then you've got this very high canal, 300 metres high, that runs along, and it's the artery of the transport hub that services the whole because they can't use, they can't use combustion engines, so they have to go back to shipping is the obvious way to transport heavy goods around and trade, yeah. So that, that, was, that, that was just a no-brainer, so that came quickly. But the social structure took longer, yeah and the symbols and the stuff like that associated with it, yeah. Cool. And the methods of control. Thank you. What, yeah, well, I'm going to come back to a question about that. Um, Rachel, what about you? Uh, for the Rift, it was a pr total self-indulgence. I just wanted to be in that world, and so I really loved... I don't know, I guess I was just... I, f I was so in love with Blackwater Island... And really, it's such an inhospitable place. <laughs> like, it is not at all an easy place to live. Like, it's not an easy life. And there's only, like, a small little shaving on the coast that is a, an actual town. And the rest of it is just, like, it'll kill you as soon as look at you because it's just a rough and, and hard place to live. But it's so, so sort of devastatingly beautiful. Um, and I just wanted to be there. I wanted to be a ranger. I wanted to, I wanted to see the mystical deer. I want, you know, I sort of wanted it all. Um, uh, but in terms of the world, and like I so said, I was really into building the culture of the rangers. And I was like, man, you know, what if if these are like generational, uh, like that people have been there for generations, and so they raise their children, and then their, and their children care for the herds and, and I was thinking, well, you know, there would be there would be a way of living, you know, and um and so I, I really got into sort of exploring their world, their values and their culture and 
um, and the head ranger and, and how do you get to be the head ranger and um, there's sort of some mysticism around that and, and the island has like ley lines and because I, I, I kept coming back to like why would, why do they persist? Like I'm like why would you endure this life where you're dealing with supernatural and external opposition constantly coming at you like at what point do, why don't they give up <laughs> they're like have the deer <laughs> let's go live on the mainland and watch Netflix you know <laughs> like, why would they do this um, but for the rangers they have like a so they, they feel the ley lines and they feel really connected to the island and so even though it is a hard life they feel the call of the of the island and and can can never leave and um, and for Meg who's returning to the island for the first time in nine years, her mother <laughs> is like, why are we doing this? So she's an outsider. The mother is an outsider to the community, and she's like, really, we're going to do this? Have you know, guys, let's wrap it up. Let's move back to the mainland. But she, but the daughter is still. She feels that that call to the island as well. That's so fascinating, and it kind of links to your other story too, because in a way, it's about identity and outsiders yeah. and all those things. I, I isn't was it? thinking about that while while yeah. I, one of the things that Bryn said made me think about. Uh, I don't know if it was another question that you had about like the what influences the storytelling, but I'm thinking, man, you know, I do I write outsiders and all of my characters, even when I'm trying to make them an insider, they're still an outsider. They still can't quite fit. Like, and even Cal with all of his gifts that make him so necessary to the community, it is with such resentment that he's allowed to be there because he's not of the blood. And so there is this, this sense of him constantly having to earn his place and to prove his worth. And for him, his internal dialogue is very much like, I'm not, I don't belong, but I desperately want to belong, you know? And, and I was thinking the same for Evie in the Spark trilogy and, and like even when, even when the, the organisation that's behind all of the genetic engineering bring her in, she still doesn't fit in, you know, because, yeah. So there is a lot of outsider But then an outsider is the person who's able to question the status quo, yeah. which is so often what the characters do, Yeah, I think. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. and it's One of the other things I think you were going to touch on this, like, uh, regarding, I guess, the, so, the, the political yeah. choices. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking, like, one of the things I cannot seem to stop including in my stories is evil corporations. And I'm like, oh, God, not another evil corporation. I don't mean to write them, but they just keep, they just keep coming up. And I'm like, oh, here we go again. There's another. E and even in the book that I'm writing at the moment, I'm like, oh, no, it's, there's, another, there's another evil corporation. And I don't mean to, but they do just keep appearing. Well, there's a lot of them out there. I know. And I'm like, <laughs> how did I know? <laughs> there's another. And I, so I don't set out to her. I don't mean to. But you've got to watch out for those evil corporations. <laughs> <laughs> if you remember nothing else today, watch out, for, watch evil out for those corporations. evil corporations. I think what appeals to me about that is that I really love writing, I really love setting my stories in a broken world that can never be fixed. And so I'm like, well, how do you find redemption for these characters in a world that you ultimately can't fix? So that always really, really interests me. So even, even if you can make it marginally better, you cannot actually solve the, the bigger overarching problem is always going to remain. And so I, I really love that tension of... But the core of character, in a way, is resilience, yes, isn't it? Yeah, Against yeah. the odds and how yeah. you survive that, which is kind of adolescence and then growing up world as well, yeah. really, isn't it? And, and so uh, those of you who aren't kind of familiar with writing, these are the questions that people grapple with all the time and they're going round. And I've, I've heard them as they're talking about, um, you know, thinking through that process, you're constantly asking yourself, well, why would they do that? Why would this world be like that? How come? And sometimes you're writing it and the character will do something and you'll think, why did they do that? And then you have to kind of dig deeper and that's the fascination of writing, but it's also what Bryn talked about earlier, that you have to understand 
how people behave and kind of dig into the psychology of it and, and, and understanding that there's these power dynamics that go on just as there are in the world, which is, is to me, politi the politics of a story is really the power dynamics, who holds the power and who, you know, who's um, not allowed to hold the power, those kind of things. And I, I wondered if I can see that time's running out really fast, so I want to combine two questions to say, um, was the politics, because it's there in there in all your stories, yours is a more kind of, um, it, it's not muted, but it's kind of below the surface a bit more than the other two. But what's the power dynamic stuff? What are the politics? And also, did you go into the story with some things that you really wanted to express at a thematic level? Because, you know, your, your books are clearly... Uh, you know, there's the climate change thing going on, which kind of rings in the background and makes it feel very urgent and real. And so I'm just interested to know what, a, what thought process has happened. And so just to break the mould, I'm going to start with you, Bryn. Okay. Well, I think... Um, it's a complicated question. So I think what started it off was the idea of Will being a decent character, a strong character, who's, despite the fact he's illiterate, he is very smart. I mean, Leah actually looks down on him initially because she, she's educated and she's surprised to find out he's a gifted orator, he's got a terrific memory for language, he's extremely perceptive, he's extremely intuitive. So that was an element of his character as well. Um, <laughs> Turn it back to the question. So with the, yeah. the, with the, like, the climate change theme in it, was that such, were you drawn to wanting to write about that? Was that... Did you have climate something you change, wanted to yeah, say definitely. about that? Yeah, definitely. Climate change was there, but again, it was as a background. I do think climate change is important. I, mean, I do think we're living in a, a, an age of extinction, um, mass extinction. It's the biggest age of mass extinction since the dinosaurs. And I do think, you know, theoretically, you could argue that humans are a pest species. You know, if you've got a really um, you know, extremist climate change activist, they could say, OK, we're a pest species. Best way to save the planet is to wipe humanity from the face of the earth. You know, that's if you, so... That, but again, that easy, Bryn. <laughs> <laughs> not the time. No, I'm not saying that's another really good book in there. <laughs> no. But um, yeah, and then of course there was the fanaticism aspect as well. So yes, it is quite political in that way because I, those were. It seemed to me those were key issues, but at the same time, it always comes back to character. And so Will is the and and the other two characters in it, they are the people who are important to me, and I think in the end. For me, the P and, and the idea that I started with, that if you had this really strong character with resilience and everything else, can he influence the people around him? I would say that is the theme. That is, that is the, the real theme. You know, the other stuff is there, and it's important, the fanaticism, the climate change. But the real theme is social systems and how people interact with each other and can decency prevail in extremely um, oppositional circumstances. That's, that's the the basic theme, I would say, for me, the most important part of the story. Watch America and we'll find out. Yeah. Well, it's optimistic. <laughs> what, about, <laughs> what about you, Rachel? Um, I, yeah, I, I, I think for me it, it is always that idea of um, the broken system and, and trying to live within the broken system. And so... Like, you know, with the Hunger Games, I was sort of thinking of, like, uh, you know, a lot of the literature that was coming out at the time when I was writing Spark, like the Hunger Games, like, or uh, like Divergent, the, like the Div Divergent series. And I, I am all about, I love that sort of, you know, badass teenage girl taking on the system and, br and bringing, you know, burning down the world and, and starting again. Like I, I love that. Like, I super love to read that. But I'm also really interested in, um, you know, President Snow will always be there. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that, that if, if you can't, if you can't be Katniss, if you can't bring down President Snow, if you can't, um, you know, break the you know, the, the controlling, whatever that's... Then, then how do you live? And how do you, how do you find peace or, or joy or have a life when the brokenness is not going to be fixed? And so I think in, in both of those worlds, and even, this, even the book that I'm writing at the moment, there's, there's that, uh, that element as well, is that, that the broken thing can't be fixed 
now still have a life? Yeah. <laughs> what, how are you going to do it? Yeah, that's, that's probably my jam. Uh, well, fantasy is always about the struggle between good and evil, um, but I didn't want to write an evil character that was like Sauron, where it's like, okay, we just need to kill the big evil, evil dude and it'll be fine. Um, I was really interested in, in, in where evil comes from, um, what the conditions for creating that, that force is. Um, and it, this very strong theme is, you know, bad things happen when good people do nothing. Um, so um, that kind of runs through the whole lot. And as I was writing the first draft, we saw the rise of ISIS, um, which, you know, everyone on the TV was, oh, they're pure evil, they're pure evil. And I was going, mm, I don't know if I believe in that pure evil thing. Um, so so that's very, it's very much um, at the heart of, of, of what the whole series is trying to do and looking at the rise of tyrants. Quite topical. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, I'm really aware that we've only got um, just under 10 minutes left, so I wonder if there are some people that would like to ask questions. I have many more if you don't, but um, please do ask. Um, my question is, all of you guys tackle quite like grown-up themes and relevant things. What made you want to write for a younger audience? I heard once, um, I, I don't know where this came from, um, that we all have an internal age where we set and we fix. Um, and I remember talking to some of my writer friends and about that and, um, and f a friends of mine who write for, for junior fiction, they were like, oh, that's true. I hit 11 and I stayed there. You know, <laughs> like, and so they write for 11-year-olds. And, and they can't help themselves. And I can remember hearing Taika Waititi talking about, like, he's got to stop writing, you know, 10-year-old Māori boys. <laughs> you know, like, but he can't help himself and he keeps writing them over and over again. And I feel like that too. I hit 17 and that's where I stayed. <laughs> and so I've always just felt that drawing to... to I love that. I, I teach teenagers as well, and so I think it's probably just in my system that my definitely my favourites. And I just think that voice just stayed. I think for me, I don't deliberately write for young people, actually. I write the stories I'd like to read, so that's probably a sign of terminal immaturity, which feeds into what you're saying. But I think also it does come from working with children for many years. You see things through a different lens. Everything's sort of fresh, exciting, acute, full of possibilities for change. So, yeah, I think it's just, you know, you know young people change the world. Tyranny, let's break it down. You know, that kind of thing. Change the world, whereas old people are more set in their ways. And young adult addresses big issues in a way um, adult fiction is often scared to do, I think. Like, you know, we can take on f um, fanaticism, we can take on climate change, we'll just go straight at it, gung-ho. Adult fiction tends to be a little bit more, you know, staid by comparison. And um, female heroes. You don't get really kick-ass female heroes in adult fiction. And I'm very in favour of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and most fun. Yeah. Uh, I'm not convinced that I do write <laughs> for young adults. Um, I, I, I think it's because I've taught young adults and I've, always, I've taught big abstract ideas, big contact, or really difficult concepts to, to young adults. So I, so I never... I never dumb it down at all. Um, so I think it's more that, the, for me, the YA label is more about, you know, can a young person chat about this book with their parents and not feel embarrassed? <laughs> or, you know, it, so, so that's more of it for me. Um, it's a really interesting genre because it's kind of a genre and not a genre. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I think there's two parts of it for me. Part of it is that... I, I like writing from that point of view, so that's the first choice, and it's because at that time, you're at your most passionate, you're looking at the world with fresh eyes, and you, you're seeing the hypocrisy, you know, that of, of the adults around you for the first time, and the systems, and that's the stuff that I'm interested in writing about. But there's another side of it, because I've written books about date rape and um, suicide and things like that, I do, believe that fiction has a power to um, change lives. And so that kind of is the bottom line of why I write. So some of the, sometimes it's to explore big ideas, but sometimes it's because I feel that I can build a story that is going to give somebody a way of working through a really difficult issue and 
not feel so alone. And, and so I feel like my energy is best served doing that for young people who need it more than adults who I kind of feel I, I've almost written off because we're the ones that have screwed things up, you know, so I would rather address the people that need it. Yeah, thank you. Do we have any other? You can probably shout and we'll hear. Um, when you talk about uh, your writing in the genres dystopia, supernatural, fantasy, and Bryn, you mentioned that you don't like reading books and you said, well, that wouldn't work, that's illogical. Is it a, does it create a bit of a conundrum when you're going off into fantasy land that things have to actually stack up as well? I don't like fantasy. <laughs> I wouldn't call my world a fantasy world. It's a possible future reality. Yeah, so it is logical, it is consistent with reality. There's no magic, there's no dragons. Yeah, I mean, I actually do, don't mind reading. I'll, I'll read George R. R. Martin until he comes out my ears. I love dragons in the right place, but my worlds uh, are, are real worlds. They are worlds that could happen. I guess thought, yeah. I was thinking more about Rachel's um, yeah. bloodhounds through the rift yeah, in different yeah. times over different ages. Yeah, does it, it, does it just come into a, a life of its own or do you have to keep sort of fact-checking and is there a lot of research just to make sure that it's sort of... Do I research those rift hounds? You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my experience of hellhounds is... <laughs> no, um, I think any fantasy, a really good fantasy has to stack up doesn't it? Like, and the most successful, um, you know, fantasy um, series, they all follow rules. You know, there's, you cannot get away with, Bryn is absolutely right, you cannot get away with any, any kind of thing that is illogical. And so you always, um, you always have to be able to, to justify what you're saying within the world of the story. And so, but as soon as you are writing something that is outside of reality, there's, an, there's a tacit agreement that's being made between the reader and the writer that we are choosing to suspend our disbelief in order to, to engage with that world. But in order to keep you there, I can't abuse that trust by having massive holes. We're like, what? You know, like, it still has to be it still has to hold up within that agreement of like, yes, I'm, I'm willing to read this story where dragons are real and magic is real. But you, you, I've made that choice, but you have to keep me there. <laughs> and I think sometimes you keep them there by believable characters yeah. that do believable things and react in believable yeah, ways. That's so, right. so as long as the character feels real, it doesn't matter what the world is. But as soon as the character does not feel like they're a real person. For me, that's when I throw the story away. The, there's a sense of making the familiar unfamiliar, I think, too, um, particularly with fantasy, because it's allegory. <laughs> yes, it's a made-up world, um, but it, the, there's a really strong relationship between our world and the fantasy world. Um, so, so the joy of it is having you know, amazing, amazing characters, because they can change it to stags and things, um, but it can't be random and all over the shop. Mm. We've got so, one more um, question. Just a small question for the four of you. What are the forces that shaped your ethical stance in the world? <laughs> oh, my That's goodness. That's a tiny question. <laughs> That's a tiny question. <laughs> Would you like me to start while you're thinking about it? Um, the forces that shaped my ethical world, Dr. Seuss. Person's a person, no matter how small. No, my father was a refugee from Hitler. My mother was brought up in Zanzibar. They had very strong um, social justice values and we were raised from day one to live those. And so I do, as much as I can. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a very big believer in, in humanity and, and the good that, that's within all of us. Um, I do a, a little bit of a sidestep in creating my own gods so that I can explore questions of faith without kind of having people come out and go, ah, you can't say that. Um, but I, 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 I'm fascinated by people with very strong faith, um, whether it's in the God or, or, in, or in something else. Um, and those, the mark that those people make on the world for the better. 
that's all goodness and light. And I do believe the world will change and we're not stuck with... <laughs> um, yeah, I think we can change the world. Well, that's a really hard question for me because I wasn't brought up in a family that held humanistic values, quite the opposite, in fact. So I don't want to go there, really. And I couldn't tell you where they came from that because I, you know, I do believe in the kinds of things that Mandy believes in. I believe that we should be free. We should have, you know... Um, things like human sexuality is their own choice, things like feminism, all those things are really important, and equal opportunity and getting rid of child poverty, everything like that. So where did that come from? And I, I, all I can say is reading. That's all I can suggest. Um, I was a keen reader from a very early age, an absolutely avid reader, and I read most Jane Austens by the time I was... Four, well, I read them all for several times by the time I was 15. <laughs> so, um, and, and a lot of classics... And I think one book that did change my life was um, Jermaine Greer. What was that book called? I've forgotten it now. Female Eunuch, yeah. yeah. I read that very young, probably about 14 or 15, something like that. And it made me really think and start delving deeper and reading more widely and those kinds of Yeah, fe books. feminism yeah, was also a very strong, yeah, strong motivator for me then, as yeah, well. There was Rock Against Racism, there was Glad to be Gay. That was all happening. <laughs> So we were out there, yeah. But I was quite a rough neighbourhood where I grew up, and uh, yeah, we didn't 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 have those values particularly. Yeah. Mm. Um, I would say reading for me as well, um, certainly very very shaping in my life. Uh, and my family, my fa I wouldn't say my family were atheists, but um, you know, God was a swear word in in my childhood. But I came to a very deep faith as a, in my late teens and so I would say that I, I have very strong faith that has that shapes the, the way that I live now which is uh, you know uh, ironic that I write these stories of brokenness because obviously uh, uh, with I uh, have a Christian faith I believe it I desperately believe in redemption um, but I would say this is a slight segue is that faith is a massive part of my writing process and so I think it, to write at all is a, is a leap of faith, and um, and you 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 lurch into the void, and you trust that the story will 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 catch you, and um and, and so there is you know faith in the process, faith in the, I mean you know we write ourselves into terrible corners, and like have what and what is going to happen, and then you have to have faith in the process, and that the creativity will actually bring you that the answers will come. And, and, and I would add yeah. faith in the readers as well, trusting that your reader will put all these crazy pieces together and, and the, the story will form in their head because it's not just here, yeah, the fully formed thing. They, they construct their own reading. So And then once it's, it's, it. it's there, once it's out there, it's no longer yours and it becomes a whole other creature as well. And, and the, way other, with the way readers engage with it it's like you have to take your hands off them and it's theirs and they can... Your baby's been born. They bye -bye. get to... Yeah, you go into the big wide world. Well, let's <laughs> interpret it the way they want. <laughs> we have to finish to go and welcome your new baby into the world. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming and thank you very much to these wonderful ladies for speaking to us today and I've just found it so fascinating. Thank you thank very, you, very Mandy. much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Mandy. <laughs> <laughs>